this part of our day is dedicated to um, the Duncan Award. And um, I'll give a little bit of a background on the Duncan Award. Um, the Duncan Award is presented every year to an individual who has demonstrated the ability to keep the whole child in view, someone who has been a tireless advocate for children with disabilities and their families, who has been a leader in the care of children with disabilities and their families, and who has consistently demonstrated compassion as well as served as an inspirational role model for others. Um, <clears throat> we're so excited to have our Duncan Award recipient right here local today um, in Seattle Children's. So um, I, <clears throat> I will um, be handing this over in a sec to Dr. Bill Walker, who is going to be um, introducing our Duncan Award winner. Um, an introduction for Dr. Walker. Um, Dr. Walker is a professor of pediatrics in the Division of Developmental Medicine. He was a division chief for many years um, in our Division of Developmental Medicine. He's currently working in the Seattle Children's Spina Bifida Program, and he ran the Spina Bifida Program for many years. Um, he has been and is a mentor to many of us here, and he helped us grow into the division we are now. I don't know what we would do without him. So I'll now hand it over to Bill to introduce our Duncan Award winner. Great. Thanks, Angela. Um, in, those are very, very kind uh, things. Uh, the division is, exists because of all the other wonderful people that have been in it over the years. Uh, it's my great pleasure to, to introduce the, the recipient of this year's uh, Duncan Award, Dr. Timothy J. Bry. I don't want to use the word winner uh, because um, there's no competition when you're able to recognize people like uh, Tim for something like this. Um, after finishing a, um, his uh, medical school and residency at the University of Nebraska, uh, Dr. Bride did a fellowship in developmental pediatrics at, the University at Cincinnati Children's Hospital and then moved on to the University of Indiana in Raleigh Hospital for Children. He was there a long time uh, with a lot of nagging and begging and uh, buying drinks. Uh, we finally convinced uh, Dr. Bry to leave the Midwest and head, and head to the real West, uh, where we were fortunate enough to have him as a uh, colleague uh, in uh, the Division of Development of Medicine uh, for almost 10 years uh, just prior to his uh, retirement. It's important to recognize, and as, as Angela said in the introduction, the, the, the Duncan Award is, is, is awarded to someone for their dedication and innovation on behalf of children with disability. Uh, I think if you look at Dr. Bry's career, uh, a couple of things that are important to note that while we know him and most folks know Dr. Bry for his work in the area of spina bifida, uh, he has had impact in a number of areas, particularly for children with disabilities. He was an executive member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Council on Children with Disabilities for many years, uh, advocating for individuals with cerebral palsy, other developmental disabilities uh, in areas as diverse as pain management, school interventions and supports, the medical home and caring for children um, with the medical complexity. Uh, he has served as the medical director for the Spina Bifida Association since 2007. Uh, his work in that uh, setting uh, has resulted in that or in the Spina Bifida Association uh, annually presenting the Timothy Bry uh, MD Outstanding Healthcare Professional Award uh, to individuals that have made a significant impact in Spina Bifida uh, and its care. He was a leader in the development and implementation of the National Spina Bifida Patient Registry and continues to be a strong advocate for that uh, longitudinal uh, data collection that now has the largest number of, uh, of data on, on individuals with spina bifida uh, probably in the world. Uh, and most recently with the fourth edition of the Spina Bifida Guidelines for the Care of People with Spina Bifida, uh, he took that project to uh, a, a, a completely new level, making it uh, valuable for providers, uh, for families and individuals. As we heard earlier today, sometimes the challenge for adults getting care with spina bifida, this has been a great resource uh, for those individuals. Uh, Research-wise, he has over 650 citations of his research and scholarly work, uh, areas including uh, within spina bifida, self-management, quality of life, family impact and resilience, multidisciplinary care, 
secondary conditions and adaptations, transition, and mental health. Uh, he also serves uh, as the associate editor for the Journal of Pediatric Rehabilitation Medicine uh, and is, leads the uh, work on that, that journal's annual issue uh, dedicated to the multidisciplinary care uh, of uh, spina bifida. Uh, for fun facts, uh, Dr. Bry, we went, went back and looked and I found Dr. Bry's first uh, publication uh, from 1981. Uh, Tim, I think you've come a long way uh, since this. The, that publication was the photo activation of far ultraviolet damage and the dinoflagellate peridinium symptom. So um, I'm I'm grateful that we're we're past um, that. Uh, I think in the area of patient care, uh, he is an, uh, a provider that has been completely dedicated and kind with uh, total commitment to his patients and families uh, and has served as a mentor uh, and role model for uh, many of us. Um, at the suggestion of um, uh, Dr. Dan Doherty, the, the current division chief, uh, we went back and pulled some family co comments from families uh, regarding their interactions with uh, Dr. Bry. Uh, and this is what families say uh, about uh, Tim and what anybody who knows Tim would say um, about uh, Tim. I lined them all up the same way because I can never read word clouds when the, when the letters go everywhere. Finally, I wanted to, to say uh, uh, one final thing from Tim's colleagues and friends. You know, there's a there's a quote that's been attributed to Tia, Fed, uh, Teddy Roosevelt that says, "Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care." Um, Tim Bry cares, and everybody that works with him knows that. Uh, Roosevelt, however, is correctly quoted as saying, "After all, it is what a man is uh, that counts," and Tim Bry counts, and he matters to so many people. Um, uh, I think uh, it's important that this audience also hear from uh, some colleagues who have worked with Tim over these past 10 years uh, in their descriptions uh, of Dr. Bry, including his colleagues describing him as humble, honest, patient, warm, and a generous man. It has been deeply powerful for children and families with spina bifida or other physical disabilities to have a physician who got it in the deepest possible sense. He knows the very real challenges faced firsthand and brought incredible empathy and honesty to the care he provided. Coupled with his tremendous knowledge and experience, this blend made for a truly stellar clinical care. His insights, effective communication, and persistence have helped our programs at Seattle Children's Hospital become more accessible and equitable for people with both physical and neurodevelopmental differences. Uh, finally, I would like to just thank the, the, the Duncan uh, Committee and all for allowing me to introduce my friend, colleague, and role model. Uh, Dr. Tim Bryant. Uh, thank you, Bill, um, and thank you, any, everyone. I'm happy to be here, um, and I am so pleased um, and honored and humbled to receive the Duncan Award. Um, I would like to particularly thank uh, the person or persons who nominated me. I'm not exactly sure who those were. Um, I would like to thank the Duncan uh, Planning Committee for selecting me. Um, most of all, I would like to thank the many families, children, and adolescents that I have worked with over my uh, career. Um, you uh, have meant very much to me. You um, have taught me uh, more than you can ever know and more than I can ever express. Um, so um, I'm humbled to have uh, attempted to partner with you to improve the lives of the families, children, and adolescents um, that I have cared for. Um, for me, this was uh, not a job. This was a calling. Um, and um, it's been my pleasure to do that. Um, those of you um, listening uh, 
and with Bill's uh, more than generous introduction, know that I have retired from active clinical practice. Um, I am soon to be 68, so I decided it was time to go when I was still doing a decent job um, in, in doing my day-to-day -day work. However, I have not um, retired fully. I continue to serve as the medical director of the Spina Bifida Association. And so now my work has gone from working with individual families um, and uh, kids um, and at a clinic level, but I'm uh, more actively involved in the strategic initiatives um, that SBA is attempting to do and the strategic partnerships and advocacy needed uh, to improve the lives and care of people with spina bifida, specifically since that's my job with SBA, um, but more importantly, strategic partnerships so that we can improve the care of all people with uh, developmental disabilities around the country. Um, we know that there are challenges uh, we know there are challenges ahead with that, um, and I, you know, won't belabor them totally. Um, but we know in spina bifida specifically that there are about 120 to 130 clinics around the country that provide care to children and adolescents with spina bifida. Um, there are approximately 20 clinics that identify that they take care of adults with spina bifida in some way, shape, or form. Um, in spina bifida land, we're calling it the care cliff. Um, and that is true not just in spina bifida, but almost all developmental disabilities occurring in childhood. Um, that is um, work yet to accomplish. Um, we've accomplished a lot over the years. Things have changed tremendously from the time I was born and through my medical career. But we know that we still have work to do to uh, provide effective individualized transition to optimize what children and adolescents can do moving into adulthood. So we need to continue to make improvements that provide effective transition appropriate for a child and adolescent and family. But we clearly need to continue to advocate. The adult systems are not yet ready for us. And it's going to take advocacy, not just with healthcare professionals, but families and individuals um, to advocate for the needs of, for healthcare um, in adulthood. We know that those opportunities exist. Um, advocacy becomes important. But separate from the challenges of accessing appropriate health care in adulthood, we also know that there are challenges that we face still in um, what I call life transition. So we need health care transition, but it's also transition beyond that. How do we support independent living? How do we train better for jobs? What are the supports needed for individuals with disabilities in the adult world? How do we better include individuals with disabilities so that they are really part, parcel, and vital to the fabric of what happens across the country? Um, those are challenges to be faced. I will probably be dead before we accomplish many of those things. Um, but, but those are the kind of the next hurdles as I see them personally. Um, we have to figure out ways to do better jobs with that. And it's going to take all of us together to try to make that happen. Um, I don't want to overstay my time, so I'm looking at my clock here. Oh, I guess I have a little time. I do not know um, the providence, luck, um, work, and sheer determination that let all of the factors of those that let me achieve what I was able to achieve. Uh, understand that I grew up in a time with my own spina bifida when most people died. Um, at the time I was born in 1956, ventriculoperitoneal shunts or any kind of treatment for hydrocephalus did not exist. 
Uh, I grew up and went to school and participated in school activities before the Individuals with, it, uh, with Disabilities Education Act went online. Um, I was able to go to college. Uh, I had a dream of going to medical school. Um, in the time that I applied to medical school, um, approximately one in four individuals who applied got in. Uh, the chances of having a disability and getting into medical school were even significantly smaller, as you might imagine. Uh, they are improved now, but they are still a significant minority of people who are able to get into medical school. I can't begin to identify all of the factors, my experiences, my parents' parenting, um, how I was included, all of those things played a role. Um, and I think um, addressing um, the dreams of individuals and with disabilities and what they hope to accomplish in childhood, uh, in adulthood, excuse me, are really factors in all of those things. So one of the challenges really in transition is it ends up being individual um, and finding out the best uh, ways to help accomplish that for each uh, individual and family. But I don't understand all of those factors uh, yet. I know that, again, my parents and family were significant supports. My church and community were significant supports. I don't know the battles, if there were any. I'm sure there were. My, my parents have actually refused to talk to me about that much in my life. Uh, but the battles that they incurred to get me into school and participating in activities, um, all of those things I think are really important. Um, and I and I have spent my life trying to think through what are those combinations of factors that support uh, effective and successful transition and adult life. Um, they're multiply complex. Um, that much I know in my research that I've done. Um, so um, I, I thank all of the people in my life, some of whom I know, some of whom I know contributed, but I don't know how they contributed. Um, but I feel privileged and fortunate that I was able to have a career um, and a calling that allowed me to utilize my strengths and talents in a way that I hope was helpful to the patients and families that I served um, and that I am continuing to um, continue to find ways to improve on a more national scale what's happening for people with spina bifida uh, in particular, but all people with developmental disabilities so that we are a fabric together uh, of people. So um, thank you very much for this award. Uh, sorry that I have rambled a little bit with this. I thought I, I thought I had it all together in my head and it kind of unraveled apart. But um, thank you very much for this award. I very much appreciate it. I continue to work to advocate. I hope you will all figure out ways to advocate. Thank you. Congratulations, Tim. Such it's so well deserved, and um, your speech was eloquent as usual, Tim. So, um, thank you uh, for all that you have done in your career and all that you continue to do. Um, it's really inspiring for all of us. So thank you. I know I ended early, so. If people want to ask me any specific questions, since there's a few minutes left, I will I will be happy to take questions. You can ask me anything you want. Sure, if anybody would like to unmute, then <laughs> feel free. We have a few minutes. Uh, hi, Tim. This is Kim Cooperman. I just want to say hi and hope you're doing great where you are and hope you're settled in. Thank you. 
I will, I will say this kind of not having day-to-day -day clinical work um, and this kind of retirement has uh, been an adjustment. Um, I'm passionate about improving care for people with spina bifida, so I now have a lot of time to devote to the Spina Bifida Association and, and their activities. So I'm using that to keep busy. Hey, Tim. Christy Bjornsson here. We miss you, and I'm so happy for this next chapter of your life. Um, I, I guess I have kind of a broad question. Um, I know you're still doing a little bit of clinical work, but um, what is probably one of the first things you say to a new family when you meet them in clinic? And I think you um, sage so that we it, tell people. It, it, um, it depends a little bit on through my career, it's depended a little bit on when I've met them, right? So um, at Riley, more than I've done here, um, I was often meeting people prenatally. So, um, you know, I would congratulate them and say, and say you're on a journey. Um, but here's the real information we know about spina bifida. Don't read anything from anywhere else. Don't <laughs> listen to the doctors who graduated 30 years ago in OBGYN. Um, you know, let's really talk about what we know and what we don't know and what you might expect. Um, if I'm meeting them postnatally now, many people now are diagnosed prenatally, so they've already heard some information with spina bifida and have made choices already. Um, and so I congratulate them and say, we have a lot of opportunities here. Let's figure out how we work through your child's entire childhood to make them the person that they can be. Um, and that my role is to be there with you on these steps and give you ideas, help provide guidance, um, um, give you support, sometimes give you rude awakenings if I think that you might be being overprotective or uh, not allowing individuals to try um, and figure out where they succeed and where they fail because all of us learn our successes, but we also learn from not being successful at things. Um, and so those are kinds of some of the lessons that I want to uh, impart early on. I will say that one of the strategic initiatives at the Spina Bifida Association is really um, improving uh, the information that individuals receive at the time of uh, diagnosis. So there is one project that we're partnering with an organization to get information out uh, to eventually community OBs uh, and community FMMs, MFMs, excuse me, maternal fetal medicine people. Um, um, and that's a project that got grant funding with another organization that SBA partnered with. And SBA is currently in the development of essentially a toolkit of multiple um, documents and resources um, that are meant to give uh, more information as individuals meet with high-risk OBGYNs and maternal fetal medicine uh, centers, uh, fetal surgery centers, so that, again, families are getting fairly systematic information um, and organized information. And that toolkit will also eventually provide um, information based on which route and action you take. So, um, so we're providing information about what happens in the NICU if you have prenatal surgery, what happens in the NICU if you have postnatal surgery. Um, so we really want to have some standardized information that uh, is more consistent across the country. That's an issue. So those are initiatives that are currently underway, and we hope most of those will be online in some way, shape, or form uh, by early 2025. But those are works in progress. Thanks, Sam. Appreciate it. Be well. Thanks, Christy. Any other questions?
I just want to mention I was a, a fellow when Tim was first hired, and I didn't get a chance to work with him as much as I would have liked because I was transitioning out of fellowhood and into attending hood. But I do remember most specifically and wonderfully how Christine, when you ask like how do you how do you how do you greet patients for the first time? And what I remember is him coming into the room, sitting down with the most wonderful, warm smile on his face. And the fact that he greets families with an expression of celebration and heart is the thing that stuck with me in all the years I worked with him. And so um, it's been an honor. Thanks, Sam. Likewise, buddy. Hey, Tim, Jeff McLaughlin here. Congratulations. We were really happy to have you with us. It was a lucky opportunity to have you in our faculty for so long. Congratulations. And Thanks, keep, Jeff. Keep up the fight. <laughs> I'm trying. You're doing a good job.